Sounds good to me. The show on the road. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. Good morning. I'm going to introduce our guest speaker in just a second, but I wanted to take two minutes to set a little bit of context. This morning, I was in a meeting of the Boulder Economic Council at the University of Colorado at a new research center the University of Colorado has for uh, Earth Sciences. And there was a presentation by the provost, the chancellor, and the CFO about what's happening at CU. And they chose to emphasize three points. One of them was about the research efforts they're doing and the buildings that they're developing to house really world-class research. The second one was what they're doing to improve their graduation rates talked about, so their six-year graduation rate is 71%. It's the best in the state, pretty much by far. Their goal is to get it to 80. And that's a very clear part of their strategic plan and a clear focus for them because, as the provost said, it's the right thing to do. We need to figure out, this is, I'm paraphrasing, but this is essentially what he said. We need to figure out what are the barriers to our students completing and how to get more of them to succeed because 71% isn't good enough. That's pretty striking. CU has mandatory orientation. They have advisors and disciplines. And in many degrees, they actually have pretty clear academic pathways. Right? Part of the reason why they're at 71. Now, a big part of the reason they're at 71 is they're a selective institution. They can take the cream of the crop in Colorado. But it was fascinating to hear him say, that they're focused on some of the same things we are. That they're trying to figure out what's the best way to help students be successful. And, and he framed it this way, it's in the same way we've been talking about it. It's a huge investment for students and families. It's not only a huge investment in money, but it's a huge investment in time. And if we're gonna invite students in, we need to do the best possible thing to help them succeed. That's really what we're talking about here, and that's why Dr. Wells is here today. It's really what can we do 
to do the best possible thing for our students. If we invite them in, how do we help them succeed? And we're actually on a great path to do that. I'm really proud of the work that many, many of you have done to advance us along the conversation, and I'm really delighted to have Dr. Wells back again because a little over a year ago, when the Student Success Task Force was starting to talk about what are the preeminent initiatives in the country that we ought to be looking at, we had Mary come in and talk about the work at Sinclair Community College to establish academic pathways. And that was a seminal conversation in the college. It really helped people frame what's possible in terms of creating clear maps for students and became, I think, the center point of our student success efforts. So we're really delighted to have her back today. I heard a little bit of the conversation this morning in a small group beforehand, and I think you'll find that um, Dr. Wells has really amazing experiences to share about how a college can start really from a place that was behind us, because in, in Ohio, they didn't have the advantages of DWDs, they didn't have statewide transfer agreements, and get to a place that we can really aspire to. Dr. Wells is Associate Professor of Psychology at Sinclair Community College, that's in Dayton, Ohio. You drive down I-75 from Detroit to Cincinnati, which I do regularly. Um, you can see Sinclair Community College perched right off of the edge of I-75. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, Sinclair has been a leader in many, many efforts nationally. Um, they're well known for uh, being on the cutting edge community college reform efforts. Um, but they're also one of the clear leaders in establishing academic pathways. So uh, I'm delighted to have Dr. Wells back, and I'm really looking forward to hearing you speak. I'm delighted. I'm debating if I need this mic or not. Tell me in the back of the room. Yes, please. All right, I'll use it. Um, and I am so happy to be here. Um, when I was here about a year and a half ago, um, I just got a sense of a group of people that really do want to do what's in the best interest of their students. And I was up here kind of amening to everything he was saying in terms of um, the importance of this. Um, it is a big investment. Right, for our students. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've done at Sinclair and what we're still doing. There was a period of time when I thought, this work will end and I will go back to my regular job. <laughs> I'm not sure if I believe that anymore. Um, it, we are a work in progress, right? Absolutely. And so um, I don't want to present things to you guys in a way that makes it seem like this is the right way to do it because I don't know that it is for you. Um, in some of what we know now, we know based on hindsight, not being you know, thoughtful about what we do. It's easy to look back and say, oh, well, yeah, that worked great. I'm glad I decided we'd do it that way, or I didn't. Um, but it certainly is still a work in progress. Um, and I'll try to share some of that with you. For some reason, I really like to talk about what we're not doing well or what we still need to work on. I'm not sure if that's a good tactic. But, um, but here we are, Sinclair Community College, Dayton, Ohio. Anyone planning your next vacation? To <laughs> well, there's a reason I took a nighttime picture or found a nighttime picture of Dayton. Some things look a little better under the cover of darkness. <laughs> um, um, I heard a comedian once. It was Elmo Phillips. Is that his name? El Emo. I was getting it wrong. Thank you. Um, and he was performing in Dayton, and he said... Um, you know what I really like to do in Dayton, downtown Dayton? I like to go to downtown after 5 o'clock and pretend I'm the only person in the world. <laughs> um, yeah, we've really struggled. Uh, we got hit really hard um, by the recession. And we're um, a community of inventors, though, right? Our most famous inventors, surely, right? You know who they are? Ab, thank you. I feel like I'm teaching now. What's the answer? Absolutely. We had some other really big ones, too. Can you think of any other famous Dayton inventors to continue my trivia quiz? A little harder of a question, I admit. Um, we invented the cash register in Dayton. I worked with an older gentleman once who insisted that he invented the ATM when he worked for NCR. He, I do work with people with disorders, though, so I can't say that was exactly true, but it's possible that we invented the ATM. 
as well. I'm not really sure. Um, the automatic car starter, um, Kettering. Yeah, Charles Kettering. Um, we're no longer doing this, right, to our cars, thanks to Dayton. Um, so we do have a lot to be proud of. We're a city of about 150,000, about 55% Caucasian, about 40% African American. Um, and we do have a lot of things going for us, but as I mentioned, we got hit really hard. We had a lot of factory jobs in our community that supported the automobile industry. And when um, the, the Great Recession hit, we lost in a period of just, well, three or four years, we lost over 50,000 manufacturing jobs just in automotive. Right? And we've had lots of others leave us as well. When NCR left in um, 2009, it almost felt like somebody was putting the final nail in the coffin, right? Because we've been hit so hard. And we hear other places are bouncing back. We hear that. You guys are, right? Your community has bounced back really well. Um, but some of us are still really struggling. Um, and our public school system in Dayton is a real issue. Um, and it's an issue for us at the community college, right? Because we know in, in Dayton, um, in the city, I'm not talking about the suburbs, but in the city, we don't have a single school that scores an A on their report card from the state. Not a single one. In fact, half of the schools in the Dayton public school system are either a D or an F, academic emergency or academic something worse than emergency. I can't remember what it is. The house is on fire. I'm not sure what that, what that last term is. 40% um, of sixth graders at the Dayton public schools don't pass the reading test. And so we really do have some deep systemic issues around poverty, in our culture, in our community. Um, we are trying to reinvent. We are a community of inventors, and we are trying to reinvent ourselves. Um, but it's hard, especially when we have such a low number of um, folks in our community that have college degrees. Uh, only about 24% of people in our area, the Dayton metro area, have a bachelor's degree or higher. And the Lumina Foundation says we need 60% of working age people in our area to have at least an associate's degree um, for us to meet the demands, right, of our community. I keep forgetting I have this clicker. I don't have to go back there like I do in class. But um, that's kind of where we come in as a community college. You know, we're really trying to address some of these issues. For me, this is, it sounds a little overdramatic perhaps, but this really has become a mission for me. Um, I believe that the single best way that we can try to break through this generational poverty is through education. And it's not just my belief. There's a, that's what the research says, too. That's the single best predictor of upward mobility um, in our country is your education. And so here we need to do more, right? We need to. There's my office right here. I was so excited when he said I had a pointer. Because I'm right there behind the, um, behind the tower there. This is our smoking stage, is what we call this at Sinclair. <laughs> Do you guys have, a, you have designated smoking areas? Yeah. Yeah, this is ours. We put them up on a little stage here in the center of campus. It almost looks like a form of public shaming or something. Yeah. Um, our founder, Sincla um, David Sinclair, coined this phrase. Um, and it sounds like a phrase that was like written in 1877 or something. Find a need and endeavor to meet it. Um, and we really do try to do that at Sinclair. We take our, our uh, mission um, very seriously. We're levy funded. And so our community supports us. And we really recognize that. But what does that have to do with you guys? Look where you guys are, darn it. <laughs> I mean, you're like living in a postcard. <laughs> I had to take a nighttime picture of Dayton, right? And here you are. <sighs> and it's lovely out today. It's really clear. Um, yeah, what does this have to do with you? You guys have great schools, right? Um, in terms of, I'll, I'll talk about the Boulder system. What I read about the um, uh, school system in Boulder is that it produces, right, some really good, um, well-prepared students. I'm sure not 100%, but well-prepared. Um, I'm sorry? We have great open positions right now. Oh, 
<laughs> You're tempting me a little bit. It is really pretty here. You, could teach you guys don't take, you take it for granted because you're always here. No, I don't. Good. I'm really glad that you don't. Um, just to do a little slight side tangent here, as I, my husband and I were driving from Denver yesterday, you know that spot where that lookout point is? Uh -huh. I, I made him pull over like a real tourist because I'm like, oh, look at this. This is, a, it's like what, um, um, Maslow would call like a peak experience, right? Where your breath is taken away. So yeah, I mean, what has this got to do with you guys? Everything's fine here, apparently. Um, I look, I'd love to have 70% graduation rates. Holy cow, that would be great. But I don't want to burst your bubble, but you also have a lot of income inequality in your community as well, right? And that can be a really hard thing for people at the bottom, that inequality. Um, right now in Colorado, kind of statewide, um, a single mother has an average yearly income of $30,000. And to take, um, to put a child, an infant, in daycare full time in the state of Colorado costs $14,000. So you have a single mother, before she pays any other bills, buys groceries, anything, right? That's where it really hurts when you're the, the really poor person, right? In a community that's doing much better because everything else gets more expensive, but nobody's paying you anymore, right? Um, Colorado does rank near the top of states in terms of income inequality. Um, oh, hello. I don't know what I did. Let me go back here and see if I can press the button. Close that window. Yeah, where's the mouse? Now I don't see the mouse. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that some technical person will come and well, rescue me from this. <laughs> That's what I do at Sinclair. I start looking around for, like, the, the CSI people or CIS, not the crime scene people. That, didn't even, that was like a Freudian slip. CIS, not CSI. I hope there's no, no crime scenes. Um, but when I flip that slide coming up in a minute, you'll see, hopefully, oh, and there you guys are, right? Even your students are pretty. <laughs> look at them. They look like they just got done doing yoga or something very Boulder, Colorado-ish. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if you look here in 2012, the top 1%, um, of income earners in Colorado made over 20% of all income. And look at their, their growth since 2009. They're doing okay, aren't they? 48% increase since 2009 in their income at the top 1%. The bottom 99% saw no increase at all. Right? So when you think about people making more money in your state, how is that money, right, distributed? In Colorado, you've got a very small percentage of people, right, who are capturing a lot of the wealth. Um, and so it really can be problematic. And, and it's especially, again, for kind of our at-risk students. So um, I'm sure you guys have no problems getting through your, um, getting students of color through your dev ed sequences. That, probably isn't an issue for you guys. Um, you probably don't have any students on your campus that their cars break down and therefore they have to drop out because they can't handle, right? They, they don't have the money to be able to do that. So it's, it's certainly an issue in terms of um, the overall um, quality of life for people at the lower end. Um, in Colorado, African Americans make 65 cents for every dollar that Caucasians make. Um, Latinos, about the same. We are seeing some rise, apparently. Latinos' wages are the only ethnic group in your state that have actually risen since 2009. So, I mean, we do this, right, because we care about our students. Um, completion isn't just about getting grant money, right? It's not just about proving how, what we do, right, in terms 
of our processes. It's got to be all about them, right? We do this because we care about our students. I sometimes say, if you don't care about students, you don't last very long at Sinclair. We'll figure it out, and we, you just won't be there that long, right? Because we have this culture of really caring about them. Um, in fact, I've been accused of caring too much. Do you ever get that one? You handhold. You care too much. Um, maybe so. They have complicated lives, right? some of our students. What we know, though, is that if students finish their associate's degree, they are more likely to finish their bachelor's degree. Coming from the liberal arts side of the house, I didn't care whether they finished. They were going to transfer. It didn't matter if they got that associate degree first. I now understand I was completely wrong, um, that that is a really potent predictor. And not only that, I can make it so when they get there at that four-year school, they're junior st standing, and they've got two years left to go. And they're not going to run out of their financial aid in their last term. They're going to be able to right, um, complete their degree. <sighs> Sometimes they're hard to care about. Is that awful to say, for psychologists to say our students are hard to care about? I don't mean it that way, but we do know that about 50% of community college students have a mental disorder or mental illness. And I mentioned that they have complicated lives. They certainly do. And again, that's why we do this, this work. But sometimes you get, you get kind of mucked down, mugged down in what you're doing here. You know, I, I already this morning to Jim started griping about our undecided pathways at Sinclair which is like this burr in my saddle. It's, oh, my la when I was here a year and a half ago, I talked about how we're getting, we're doing these undecided pathways. We really haven't made much progress at all in the last year and a half. It can be so frustrating. Um, are, do we have financial aid people in the room this time? Because when I talked earlier, we didn't. All right, good. Um, <laughs> and it's all about financial aid, right? And we have a very kind of rigid, financial aid director and compliance officer, and I appreciate that. But I need to help undecided students too, right? It just gets really frustrating. Um, I was actually, I had just got a, had a horrible phone call, um, and I, then I had to go take a group of students to a conference. You ever have something, like, you're like not in the right frame of mind to do what you need to do next, but you've got to go do it anyways. It was my principles of counseling class. Um, and um, I wanted to take them all to like a cultural awareness conference that Sinclair does every year. Um, and so that's what we did. I sat down, kind of not happy to be where I was, quite honestly, think, thinking things like, I should just go back and teach full time, right? And let somebody else worry about these pathways, and these undecided pathways. Um, it was Tony Hall. I don't know if you guys, he's a um, former congressman and a UN ambassador um, on hunger. And he was our keynote speaker that morning. I went back over my notes later and I saw I had managed to write down three things from like an hour and a half. And it was only because I knew I was gonna have lunch with my students later and I had to like have this meaningful reflection right on the experience. And uh, I was like, oh God. So you know, I, so the three things I wrote down were um, that number one, Dayton ranks fourth in the nation for hunger, that we are fourth in terms of food insecurity in our community. And I thought, oh, geez, let me add that to the list of bad things I can tell people about you know, my community. It's almost like it frustrated me. Um, and then um, another thing I wrote down was that one in six Sinclair students are food insecure. One in six of those students. And then the final thing, he talked a lot about Mother Teresa in his um, uh, presentation and um, his meeting her, right? And um, the last thing I'd written down was something that she said to him, which was five words. I've since learned it's a Bible verse. I should have probably known that. But um, bloom where you are planted was the, were the five words. And so that was all I managed to write down to stimulate this important conversation with my students that I wasn't really that I was kind of preparing to phone it in. It's what I was doing. I'll just put it that way. Um, and so we all went through the lovely buffet line of food. They feed us well at Sinclair, right? And, and we all sat at a table. There was me and about seven students. And so we started talking, right? And I started talking about, well, what did you guys think? We're the fourth hungriest city 
in the United States, and we talked about that for a while. It was going well. I'm thinking, all right, this isn't that bad. I'm still thinking about those undecided pathways, though. And oh, sometimes if I could just get the financial aid director alone in a room. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, and um, we, and someone said, and so I said, did that surprise you to know there's so many students at Sinclair that are hungry? Um, and the young woman sitting next to me, Sam, this was a Friday afternoon, about noon, and um, she spoke up and she said, this is the first thing I've eaten since Wednesday night. And I was just taken back. I was like, holy crap. Um, and then she went on to say, she goes, I was so embarrassed when I was going through the buffet line. She goes, did you guys notice how much food I took? She goes, I took so much more food than you guys did. And we all said no, and we hadn't, right? Nobody was really paying attention. Um, and then she said, did you guys notice how fast I ate? And we were like, no. She's like, well, look, you also have food on your plate. My plate is empty. Both of her plates, she had a salad plate too. She was so excited that she got to have a salad. She said she couldn't remember the last time she'd eaten something green. Right? That it was just cheeseburgers and crap, that, the stuff you can afford to buy when you're poor. Um, her mom had got laid off from NCR. In 2009, parents got divorced. So that mom was so depressed, immobilized almost, right? Couldn't even get out of bed. Um, and here is this young woman, 18 years old, right, freshman, trying to hold all of this together. Um, and then I, I looked at that last line, or I thought about it, and I thought, she's planted right next to me, right? There she is. I get a little, I, I think it's the perimenopausal. Do we have nurses in the room? <laughs> I, it, does that emotional stuff happen with that? I'm not sure if that's a symptom. But I get a little verklempt because I thought, I was so in the weeds, right, worrying about what that financial aid director won't let me do, that I was losing sight of what this is all about, right? Um, and so I think our students are why we do this, right? And, and even though you might think, well, how do your pathways make or help her life, right? Um, if she was at Sinclair a few years ago in my department, her odds of graduating would have not been so good. A few years ago, she would have probably not graduated. She would have just had a student loan debt no credential to get out and get a job, right? And if she did decide to transfer on, chances are she's got a lot more than two years before she can finish. And maybe not enough financial aid. It's not like her parents, right, are contributing to this for her. So yeah, we have to remember it's because of them, right, that we do this. And we know that if we can get them into a program of study early, right, then we can we can really turn things around. We lose 50% often in that first year, right? The second year retention. We can impact that. And the one thing that all of us can do is to care and relate to them. You guys have probably seen the research, right? That when students reflect on what mattered to them, what helped them get through college when they were feeling really down and they weren't going to make it, it's almost always a relationship with somebody on your campus. It may be a student, but it's often a faculty member, an advisor. I mean, we've got a lady at, on our, this doesn't matter, in our building three uh, lunch line or lunch area um, that is the most warm and loving. Students say, I was having a really bad day, and I went through that line, and she just makes me feel better. And so I do think that we have to remember that it's all about them, except for this next slide, because I did say, well, care about yourself too. So completion is absolutely good for our students. You can't argue that it's not. Um, and I do come from a liberal arts background. And I, I appreciate diversity in terms of the um, classes that students take. But is it worth them not graduating? Right? Is it worth it? Um, and I think we have to decide what's more important to us. For me, this principal's a counseling class. Ooh, it's two times I've been able to teach it since the pathways went in. But I barely get it to run, where I used to have 20, 25 students easily. Now I barely get it to run. Um, and that hurts. But Sam's more important. Do you know what I mean? That she gets through is more important than me getting to teach that class. 
that I really like. And so sometimes I think we have to make those really hard decisions. But I do want you to care about yourself too, in your college. Um, so as the state of Colorado, I'm sure they're giving you more and more money, right, to be able to fund your school. Isn't that the trend in the state? No, no. You, in fact, you have seen population increase an increase in the number of high poverty students in Colorado, and your funding has gone down at the same time. And join the club, right? Welcome, because that's the way it is. Um, and so if you want your school to be successful, if you want to continue right to have students to teach and advise, um, then you really do need to think about a trend that's happening across the nation um, and that's outcome-based funding. And this is not the Republican electoral map. <laughs> I'm not going to talk to you about who's got 1,231 delegates. No. This is a map that looks at outcomes-based funding in higher education. The darker the color, I was going to say the worse it is, but I shouldn't say that. Because uh, really, the jury's still out on whether completion-based or um, outcomes-based funding is a good idea or not. But you can see how dark we are in Ohio. We are way into it. In fact, we don't get funded for enrollment at all, right? Zero percent of our funding from the state is based on enrollment at this point. Now, you guys, look at you nice people in gray, very light gray, nice color. Um, so next map. The blue states are the ones where we currently have development. They're either developed or developing, but not implemented yet. Well, I don't know. It looks like it's coming your way. Um, and it is something to consider. And I don't want to suggest that, um, that we're going to have different standards, because I think we have to be really careful that we don't lower our standards when you start talking about completion and, and course success. But just a few years ago, this is how Sinclair's funding streams broke down. And so you can see we got a hefty dose from the state. But we've seen a gradual um, phasing out of that. It's not too gradual, if you ask me. But um, beginning in 2014, it was 50% enrollment, 25% course completion, 25% success points. The um, course completion um, also includes degree completion, so there's um, kind of a completion metrics there. But this um, year, beginning in um, 2015, we no longer have any um, enrollment-based funding at all. Okay? Now we are all on just these um, performance-based. Um, yeah, that's what it feels like. <laughs> And if you're Sinclair, it feels like you're District 12. Because the funding model that the state of Ohio has come up with seems to be favoring colleges with, fair, with less diverse students and um, with um, um, less diverse students and also um, less um, poverty in terms of their um, districts as well. Um, better school systems feeding into their community colleges. They're, they're do, looking pretty good. In fact, most of those are doing much better under the new funding model than they were doing before. The ones that are really taking the hit are the big ones and the ones that have the most diverse populations um, and also those of us who have not the greatest school systems feeding into our colleges. Um, and so it certainly is hard to get that funding formula right. But I don't know, it just doesn't make sense to me that you would want to hurt the colleges that have the most issues, right, that are taking, arguably, right, the most challenging students and trying to get them through. So it can be frustrating, but um, states vary a great deal in terms of what that formula looks like. So you guys may be a different movie altogether. Who knows? You could be, I don't know. I can't think of a good analogy. But let's talk a little bit. I've yapped enough. I do this in front of my students sometimes. I'm just, I get so interested in what I'm saying that I forget that you guys might want to say something too. So let's talk a little bit about what are your concerns? And it can be about pathways, which we're going to focus on 
Um, or it could be about just this completion push in general. I've got a lot of my own, but I'd really like to hear what you guys think. <coughs> Do you have worries? I, I'm concerned about the students who feel or seem to be unable to hold a full schedule yeah. because of other demands in their lives, right. financial demands, family demands. And, and I do believe in the pathways. I think those are wonderful. But, you know, they require 15 credits per semester, which I don't, I'm an advisor. I don't right. see many students scheduling 15 right. credits per semester. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mentioned it when we were talking earlier um, that St. Clair has um, four-year pathways as well. So we have part-time pathways. But honestly, advisors don't find them that useful um, because lots of students don't take a half-time approach either. They have such a variety of enrollment patterns. Yeah, I think it is a concern, and we know that their outcomes, right, um, reflect that less engagement on our campuses. Yeah. Do you guys have a lot of working students, too? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's in clear about 50% of our students are working. Um, and so, yeah, that it really um, impacts. And I don't know, we've been trying to do that 15 uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for? 15 to finish um, stuff. But we have a lot of folks, students, that just want 12. Give me the minimum number to get my financial aid, right? And no more, no less. And so that's really hard, too. You can't get them out in two years um, with 12 credit hours a semester. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of challenges. Yeah? So you mentioned your own issues with not getting to teach your favorite classes often as yeah. you want. Um, I've been, I teach philosophy. I've been thinking a lot about what it means to think about programs instead of prefixes and classes. Can you talk a little bit about that? how those conversations among faculty went at your school and what we might expect here and how we might guide those conversations? Yeah, I, I think um, our humanities department, which includes um, political science and modern languages and some other stuff, um, they got hit really hard in the pathway work. Um, I mentioned earlier as well that at the same time we were doing pathways, we also had a state mandate to reduce all programs to 65 hours or less. And we had some programs that were at 75 hours. Um, and when those cuts were made, humanities took it the hardest. Because when chairs cut classes, they didn't cut their classes. I, they, I'm not going to cut a class my faculty teach. I'll cut one that that philosophy guy teaches. Right? And it's, I think sometimes it's a lack of understanding and value of general education. Um, for us, though, the state mandate at the same time really um, pushed. But in our humanities department, um, it you know, traditionally was one of our largest departments in terms of the number of sections run. And um, now they are only running enough to have a couple of adjuncts active. Um, it's tough for them to get um, enough of a load for their full-time faculty. So we've seen a big impact, and I won't, I won't try to sugarcoat it in any way, shape, or form. Um, as the curriculum becomes more prescriptive, and um, especially those technical programs um, start looking at what do I need to cut out, um, what doesn't make sense, it seems that the gen eds, um, especially the humanities, at least on Sinclair's campus, are taking a hit. Yeah. Um, I still teach that class. Right? I haven't lost it yet. Um, I, so I still hold out hope that um, I can have enough program students, right, that, that I can get that class going. Um, in psych, we have about 300 or so. So, right, I've got a big enough pool, but we don't usually have that many, like, political science majors, um, where psych is, you know, one of those popular majors just based on, I don't know what, just based on whatever. Um, so yeah, I think it is hard, and I think that it's wise to expect some degree of impact when, when people start following the pathways. Yeah. Other concerns? Yes? So what, what are you doing to help the undecided find a program that they Yeah. Um, not nearly as much as I would like to do. Like not back to financial aid again, but um, we're trying to do one term undecided pathways that then feed into our career communities or meta majors. Um, and again, there's concern about not running afoul of the financial aid statutes and regulations. 
Um, and so that's certainly part of the issue. But we're, right now, we have a hard time identifying exactly who is undecided. Because you can't be undecided. You've got to check one of those boxes on the application. And so trying to identify who really is undecided and intervene and help them can be a challenging thing to do. Um, again, I think if I could take out a hit on our financial aid director, right? No, tease. Um, I do think we're moving towards, because we're seeing a number of other schools that are now putting in these um, exploratory pathways. And so I think he's becoming increasingly comfortable with the idea, but not willing to pull the trigger quite yet. Um, so I think we will move in that direction. And I think it will help us not only identify who really is undecided, but our tentative plan is that we will schedule them for the first term and put a hold, a registration hold, until they're back into advising, because we don't want to leave them undecided. And financial aid laws don't want us to leave them undecided either. And so we need to, as quickly as we can, after that first term, move them back into advising and help them make a good decision. Um, the idea, though, with the meta majors or career communities is that you have, um, you know, a number of, well, I'll show you an example from Lorraine here in a few minutes, but you could have one term that might feed into 12 different degrees um, and students wouldn't lose a step. I saw somebody say, yeah. are you facing the fact that financial aid is, we're looking at, they're not going to be paid for classes that are not? Yes. Have you already been through that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so that's absolutely something we struggle with. I felt so bad for all of our PE classes. We used to have tons of Zumba classes, and um, you know, if, and I value that for our students because I think the whole mind-body thing, the um, um, mindfulness, is. Okay, the rich kids can take those classes, but the poor kids can't. I think that there's some logic in that. Yeah, but no, we we certainly can't put things on students' maps that are not part of the degree audit. Yeah, so it does have to be, and that makes it makes a difference. Like, you know, I used to have all sorts of students in my principal's counseling class. Um, they wouldn't all be psych majors, and not anymore. They're all psych majors now. So just to let everyone know that our, actually our director of financial aid and, and our directors across the system are looking at very, um, they're looking at an undeclared degree pathway, so they're the ones pushing it, which is great, because That's they great. know that all these, I um, am going to move here. <laughs> <laughs> See, we have a great director of financial aid. Um, and so we are, for that, for that very reason, we just um, onboarded a new uh, program called Recruit to look at our prospective students. And um, they can choose undeclared. In okay. That. And by far, you know, the students who are entering are saying they're undeclared because they don't know what they want to study. Right. And so, because we're seeing that need, we're like, okay, we need to look at how we could have an undeclared pathway. We're not there yet, right. but we're looking at what that. Yeah, would be. and um, um, give me your email later. I'll hook you okay. up with someone who's worked out the financial aid part okay. of it quite well. It's not in my college. I'll point you to somebody at Lorraine <laughs> County Community okay. College um, um, because she really worked at the level where, like, I'm listening to her and I don't even understand what she's saying anymore. Because she's all into numbers, the statute numbers, and, and why this works and doesn't work. Um, and so um, I think there is a way to do it. What seems to be really important from the federal financial aid point of view is that when they declare that they're undecided, that they have to recognize that they are um, in a pathway. So it is still a program, yes. And they have to understand and kind of um, their application itself, it makes them almost acknowledge that by checking this box, you are degree seeking, I think is the way that it's worded. But she shared all of her um, application language with me and all of the um, conversations, documentation around the, the financial aid stuff, where it does get complex. Yeah. Well, I sometimes wish this. Or like little elves will all show up on our campuses overnight when we return the next day. Everything will be fixed. But it just doesn't work that way, right? We've got we've to do more. And at St. Clair, we have a number of initiatives going on. These are the four big ones. The pathway work largely comes under completion by design. Um, but the Connect for completion is our advising models, the career communities. So there is overlap here, right? Um, especially in the undecided students. And we're working it so hard. 26% increase in overall graduation 
um, in the last two years. And so, thank you. We still got a ways to go, right, to get to the goal of 5,000 um, graduates a um, few years from now. But we are definitely moving in the right direction. But one of the things I've learned is I've got to be patient. You can't put your pathway in and then think all of a sudden your graduation rates go up. Even if they're doing it right, it's going to take two years once they're right on the pathway. And so um, some of this, it takes a while for it to turn around. I'll show you some psych program data a little later on because we were the first pathway in, and so we got a little more. Um, and there are a lot of um, strategies, but today we'll focus on what I should have called maps, just to not make you guys confused, because we do use the term um, in different ways. But again, this reorganization of the college was a big um, part of it, too. You know, this is the problem for our students with pathways. This is it. They want more direction. They're lost, and we need to help them figure this out. My husband is the poster child for this. I, I was tempted. I said, can I take a picture of you? I'm just going to put it in my PowerPoint tomorrow. He's like, no. Um, but he currently has 80 credit hours that doesn't add up to anything. Yeah, 80 credit hours that add to nothing. And we have so many people that have college credit with no credential to back it up. Um, and so this is the issue. They really are lost in a maze. And then we give them a bunch of choices, too. Right? And that can be really um, challenging for students. Right? Select 12 from a list of 300 or more. It's hard to make good, thoughtful decisions. Um, choice theory, behavioral economics really suggests this. Right? If, if you're a supermarket owner and you stock 45 kinds of jelly, you will sell less jelly than this, the store owner who only stocked to five or 10 types of jelly. Because we'll get to a point where we just say, I'm out of here, right? I can't even turn the TV on anymore because you've made the remote so complicated. And that's really where our students can be too, right? And uh, our students may be first generation. How many of you guys are first generation? Yeah, look at us. There's a lot of us in the room. So we don't necessarily have the cultural background, per se, right, that supports us. I can remember when I was a student at OU, my first term, homesick, right, just ready to throw in the towel and calling my mom and saying, Mom, I want to come home. I'll just go to Wright State. And she was like, I think that's a really good idea, honey. This, you just weren't cut out for this. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time thinking, that's not what I wanted you to say. <laughs> what I wanted her to say was, no, you can do this, right? I know it seems tough now. Your first term is always a little bit harder. You're getting used to lots of things. But no, don't quit now. You can do this. Just hang in there. But my mom went to the fifth grade, right? She, it's not a conversation. That she, and I'm not saying she was a bad mom because she told me to come home. She was just doing what she thought was best for me, you know? It was scary for her. And she thought that would be in my best interest. And so when you are a first generation student, you don't necessarily have that support. Even if you've got loving parents, the support is a little bit different, right? When my 17-year-old and I now talk about um, um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> when um, I'm talking with him now as he prepares to apply for colleges, what a different conversation I'm having with him, right? He was looking at an art school that was a for-profit one. I'm like, really? <laughs> what if you want to go on? None of that's going to transfer. Ohio State, if you want a master's in fine arts, they're not going to take the school of advertising stuff, right? But my mom would have never known to have said, oh, well, but you want to go on and have that degree. And as I look at this curriculum, I don't think it's going to transfer well for you. Right? I mean, that's okay. Did you guys remember what's behind the screen? Do you remember what's behind the black? This is not a quiz. I'm not. But it's a sign that kind of really struck me because it was the kind of advice we were giving students. Right? All sorts of advice and different advice. <laughs> Sometimes advice that actually contradicted the advice they got from someone else. And we did use our students as these conduits of information, right? So they go to advising, 
they get advice, they come to me and say, the advisor says I should do this, take these classes. Well, that's wrong. I, who did you talk to? Oh, some old lady with brown hair and, like, really? Well, go back and tell them that I told you this is not right and to fix this. Right? That's what we used to do. And, and it ended up that that old lady was like a 30-year-old or something. Do you know what I mean? I would have never found her walking through advising looking for an older brown-haired lady. Um, but we don't do that anymore. We've stopped doing that. Um, they were even getting different advice from different advisors, right? They'd see different advisors each time. They get different <laughs> advice. And students hated it. We got some really bad customer satisfaction ratings from our students when we were under that generalized advising model. Um, but now, hopefully, we're moving in the right direction. But our students tell us this time and time again. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it, right? Just tell me what to do. Give me some help direction. Here are the things they really want to know. And I make it seem like, oh, simple, just answer these for them, right? It's not so simple. But do a lot of your students arrive with not any idea of what they want to do in terms of a job? What do I want to be when I grow up? No. And heaven forbid they know what I should major in to be what I want when I grow up, right? That's a whole other thing. And then what classes, right? Somebody tell me. I've had students say that to me. Well, tell me what to take. Just tell me. Um, how long will it take and how much will it cost? And then finally, will my credits transfer? And bless their hearts, they don't even know how to ask the question correctly, right? Because I can say, sure, those will transfer. But boy, that doesn't necessarily mean what they think it means. Because I could just mean, yeah, sure, it'll transfer as electives. And it doesn't count at all towards the program you're transferring into. But we say it transfers, and they don't understand that, right? That's a, a bit of minutia we have to help them with. So do you think they're having problems in terms of, is, is the career undecided part of it a, a big struggle on your campus? Do, are they doing anything in the high schools here in terms of helping students? Are they doing a good job? Because we've got some stuff going on in Dayton, and it's not, yeah. Variable. What's that? Variable. Very variable, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, it certainly is true for us that our students don't know what they want to be when they grow up. They really don't know. Um, I think in the state of Ohio, we now have a program called uh, College Credit Plus for high school students. They can take classes for free. And um, as part of that, it seems like they're going to try to incorporate some of this um, career counseling sorts of issues. But we got students coming in, they don't know what in the world they want to do. Um, what about programs? Do you guys have trouble figuring out okay, which program is best for this student? It can be challenging. I was mentioning at Sinclair, we have social work, psychology, and mental health technology. And for a student, you know, M is the first one on the application because they're all li you know, listed alphabetically. I've had a student tell me that before. Well, I was scrolling down, I got to mental health. I want to be a mental health counselor, so I checked it. Right? Not understanding that that's a technical degree an AAS degree, and it's not going to transfer. You're not going to be a counselor by taking that pathway at all. In fact, you've likely wasted money, and if, you, right, if we could have got you on the right pathway to begin with, that's what we need to do. So it's certainly a big thing. Again, people talk about what a pathway is in different ways. And for you guys, I'll try my best to just substitute the word map in. But when I started this work, Pathways was what we called the academic um, portion, right, of the path. And now it's more about the entire student journey, right, from connection all the way through to getting them a job and getting them out of there. Um, but we really focused on these um, structured academic pathways or maps. The um, departments, um, faculty developed them, and then they were reviewed by advisors. And there wasn't a single pathway that was not changed in some way based on the in, uh, input of advisors. It's one of the things that I didn't understand as a faculty member before, how much they could help me. These are great helpers, right, in terms of being able to um, catch things that I wouldn't have thought of from the faculty point of view. Like, well, okay, you say that you want them to take geology for that elective, but did you know that that one's not even offered fall term? 
I wouldn't have known that. But our advisors have a tendency to understand that. They think much more than I do, and, and most faculty, I think, from the student's perspective. Um, and also scheduling. They understand how students want to schedule their classes as well. And sometimes faculty, we don't, we don't well, when it's best for me to teach. That's when I want my classes, not when the students, right, need to take them. And that's what the um, advisors really help us with. Um, at, again, at the beginning of this, we were generalist um, in terms of advising. So there were no specialists, um, but there were specialists. Do you know what I mean? They were like specialists in particular programs, but it was all on the down low or the low down. Which one's, one of them is inappropriate, so whichever one is not inappropriate <laughs> is the one I meant. Um, so yeah, I would know that Carla is really good with the psych program, right? And so if I had a student that needed to see an advisor, I'd say, well, just make sure you see her. And now Carla's got a line out her door because of all the psych students, I keep referring to her because I didn't trust anybody else to understand the program. Um, and I don't do that anymore. Now I say, well, first of all, you may have one assigned, um, and so I'm not gonna tell you to go to one that's not assigned. But um, also, I have relationships with all of the advisors in my career community. I, you know, if Carla doesn't pick up her phone and this student needs help right away, I've got other people I can call. Um, and I know them, and they know me. Um, our advisors now come to our department meetings, for example, um, on the academic side. And we sometimes attend the advising meetings as well. So it was a true collaboration. Um, but they were so important as reviewers. Um, they caught things with hidden prereqs, all sorts of things that we wouldn't have thought to put into our maps. And our maps are wordy. Um, one of my other like ongoing pet peeves is they took down my student views of my pathways, and that really ticked me off because I can't like show you them in, um, in actuality. But they do tend to be wordy because we have a lot of um, notes that we put in. And again, the most um, controversial part of what we did was recommending electives um, instead of just open gen ads. And it was hard. It was really hard to be able to um, sometimes even figure out what was the right science course to go with music. I remember the, the music chairperson was like, I don't care. Just put them in any science. I don't care. I'm like, well, but don't you think one of the sciences, we could contextualize it? To, you know, music, he's like, oh, just shut up and write one down. He could have cared less. Mm -hmm. I put physics, because I believed if you understand physics, right? See, I think there is an underlying logic. But sometimes the departments didn't care so much. Sometimes we did, though. Like for psych, we recommend biology. And it's not just because we think that's an important foundation for understanding human behavior, but also when I went to, and looked at all of the um, four-year schools in the state of Ohio, and the psych programs, if they required a science, it was biology. And I haven't found a psych um, program yet that required astronomy. Right? It was always biology. And so by recommending biology to my students, regardless of where they transfer, they have a greater likelihood of that requirement being fulfilled because I made that recommendation. So we strongly recommend biology to students. And we don't even tell them that there are other sciences that they could take. We always put a link to our transfer module, right? So students can always go and look at the whole module. But I'm not going to tell them about astronomy. Take biology. That's what I want you to take. Right? may not sound particularly open-minded. Um, but again, we're really trying to contextualize the experience for students. Um, there are a number of design principles. The pathway um, stuff that you guys are doing, um, I'm assuming, has lots of kind of guiding design principles as well. And I will not bore you by going through them one by one. But um, there are eight of them for completion by design. But this first one here sounds like a no-brainer, right? I mean, of course they have to know what to do, how to succeed. But it's really not necessarily as simple as that. So we do, um, again, put a lot of, of uh, context into these notes. Um, this is an advisor's view of the term by term um, within our MAP SSP software. And so these are the, the classes and the order that the um, department, this was VizCom, um, chose. And so that's what it looks like in our system. Here's one of the headers. So 
All of our information from the faculty is captured on um, Excel sheets. And so we have headers in different places. And we put all of the pre-programmed sorts of information in a big header at the top. Because some programs are like this, and there's a whole lot you need to understand before you enter that pathway. Other times, there may not be that much in the header. Um, but certainly for um, a program like nursing, where there's wait lists and prereqs, that's really important. <coughs> but it's not just admission stuff. Um, for example, if you want to go into early childhood education, you can't have a felony background in the state of Ohio. Right? And so I want a student who has a felony background to understand that before they ever take a single course. I don't want to be in a year and figure out, oh gosh, I can't even get a job in this field. Um, also, extra expenses. There are lots of programs where you think, I'm just paying for books and tuition, but there can be additional, sometimes big expenses um, for nursing, right? The, the um, uniforms that students wear, um, some of their equipment as well has to be purchased. The big one at Sinclair is we, where we wouldn't be Dayton if we didn't do pilot training, right? And so we have a pilot training program at Sinclair. And you look at it and you think, oh gosh, for just the same price as tuition, I can learn to fly. But what we don't tell you <laughs> is that um, all of the time in the airplane, you pay for yourself. You pay for the, the flight instructor time, and you're also paying for all of the time to be trained in the airplane. It's really, really expensive. Uh, thousands of dollars, I don't have an exact figure, but it's really expensive. And students should understand that as well. So we try to include a lot of context in our um, pathways. Let's see, all right, I must have it later on. So far we have 200, um, and we do have the part-time pathways as well. Um, the pathways, um, for, for us on the liberal arts side, the transfer agreements were really crucial for the pathways to work. So I'm not sure how you guys divide up in terms of workforce or technical versus liberal arts transfer programs, but the, the transfer agreements are really important. And like you said, we're, you guys are ahead of us in terms of having some statewide sorts of agreements. But for us, you know, we really had to get those transfer agreements shored up. The big one for us was Wright State because about two-thirds of our students will transfer there. And so that's where we started first, was to get that one shored up. And um, also policies and procedures, because these are um, living documents. Um, curriculum is not static. Sometimes I wish it was, because um, then I could stop doing pathway work, but it's not. Right? There are changes to the curriculum that occur all of the time. And so we have to keep these updated every year. So we store them or log them by catalog year. And so each year, about this time actually, um, the lead advisor in the career community contacts all of the programs and check in on if there are any changes to your curriculum. And they're also looking in our management tool for that. So there are certain reports that pull out for them if there are big major changes in curriculum so that they can be aware of them. But even little changes, um, they'll talk to the department chair about that. Maybe the default elective that they recommended isn't working so well, and now they want to recommend a different elective. Those sorts of changes happen at Sinclair in about a week, two-week period of time. We have to do it before the students register, but after the catalog, I don't know, it's really complicated. But there's like a two week period of time where the lead advisor has to update all of our pathways um, and templates. And that um, takes a fair amount of time. And it's actually written into her job description. So one of the ways that we ensure that things don't fall apart um, is to codify things in terms of job descriptions. So it's gotta be somebody's job. It has to be someone's responsibility. And a good way to make sure that that person understands and um, sees going forward is to make sure that their job and description right, includes some of these processes needed to, to keep things up to date and moving. If I ask all of my colleagues at Sinclair to do all of this work and then it just fell apart in a year or two, I would have to move to Colorado, I'm afraid. Right, because people would not want me around them anymore. Because it certainly was a lot of work. I'm gonna. This is a little video. I don't know if you guys have seen it before, but it kind of speaks to. It's from the sense. Um, 
reports. All right. Can you guys hear? Because I'm not sure those are on. Don't you love technology? He is talking about how wonderful pathways are. I know you can't hear them. Um, Try the microphone on the speaker. It's no, like these aren't working. Computers. On the bottom right. No, no biggie. I'll um, I'll send um, my PowerPoint um, back to to Jim or someone else, and I'll I'll leave those video links in there. And when you're really bored in your office one day, you can watch these inspiring videos. But it is students talking about how they really want us to help them in terms of more direction. That's okay. It's okay. Let's see if I can get it to stop. This might be the more challenging. Oops. All right. Psych. I'm going to have to close out of that. Oh, you're okay. It's, it's no big deal. Um, so again, we've really had to um, keep all of our policies and procedures up to date. Um, and we actually did a big policy review, a policy <laughs> audit at Sinclair that really helped us hone in to some things that maybe weren't working well for us and others that might be working well. Um, so when you think about the pathways that are being done on your campus, the maps, do you, do you get a sense that some programs are going to be easier than others? Seeing some head nodding. Which are going to be the easy ones? What's that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, they didn't put up much fight at all. I sound like faculty are just going to revolt or something. But no, the technical folks, the business people, they were like, sure, this makes good sense. Let's do this. It was, it was us in liberal arts that tended to be um, more concerned about the process. Um, and concern that, right, how do we know that we need some people to pick us as electives? And so you get in this process of feeling like you need to market yourself. Yeah, was there a question? Yeah. Um, how did it work with the five different locations, different campuses? Yeah, we have the same um, templates and internal system for all of our campuses. The thing that's different is on our smaller campuses, we can't always advise just within career communities. Um, and so they do a little bit of double duty, although they still have areas that are their specialty, but they are more likely to do double duty in so terms of... created the maps, you have people from each one of the campuses, or? No, Well, the faculty um, at Sinclair move around between campuses, and so um, we had the faculty. But yeah, it wasn't intentional to kind of pick folks that were necessarily working at the satellites because we do travel to all of them and the main campus staffs the courses at the satellites. Yeah, so for us it wasn't that much of an issue. Um, and I don't think there's only one campus where a student for our satellites could complete a couple degrees fully on that campus. Um, so ours are set up more for, we run a lot of gen eds and kind of the gateway courses through those. Yeah. Uh, who needs it the most? Who needs pathways the most? Yeah, it is us liberal arts people. It really is. The more choice and flexibility you have in your degree, the um, more you probably need the pathway work. And so it's, it's, um, it's an interesting paradox, right, that we put ourselves into. But it is often. I'm like walking right towards the camera now and moving in front of it. And it does become the liberal arts again, like, like our philosophy person said, that really feel like they get hit kind of hard in terms of some of this. Um, the sociology department, for example, just felt really sure that everybody was going to pick psych for their social science elective instead of sociology, because people just know what psych is more than they know what sociology is. And I think that was a little bit true to some extent. Um, but I think they underestimated um, their visibility on campus. They're a well-respected department. 
um, and they're really rigorous and good in terms of what they do. So I don't think they got hit as hard as they might have thought, but there's certainly a lot of, of work that often needs to be done. And I'll, I'll tell you guys about my the psych program here. Move us through a little more quickly, hopefully. Now my clicker has stopped working. Let's see. It's like we're, oh, I think that was it. That was it. It was just, no, no, we're fine. Um, and I just feel like I don't even need to tell you guys about DevEd, right? I, in fact, I'll, I'll move through it pretty quickly. Um, intent, another thing is to make sure we get them right into a program. We know the earlier we can connect them to the program, to what they want to study, the more likely it is that we will retain them long term. And so we sequence our courses, but we're always trying to put that first major course on um, the, the general psych or the other intro course for that major into that first term, if at all possible. We want that in the first term as well. For certain um, students in certain degrees, they've got to start math right away. If you're an engineering student, you can't say, I'm going to, put, I'm going to wait and do all that math the last term. I'll just take seven maths. You can't do that, right, the way that they stack. And so we have to make sure. Um, I mentioned these um, recommending of electives, again, one of our more controversial things. And then the undecided pathways, my, my nemesis. Here's an example of um, the template on which faculty recorded the information. And you can see there are two levels of notes, advisor and student notes. So advisors can see all of the notes. Students only see student-only notes. And so there may be things that's just a little too much information for students or contains jargon that they wouldn't understand. Or sometimes it's, a, it's an issue around saying something to an advisor you won't, don't necessarily want to say to a student. Like, if students really struggle with math, consider this one instead of this one, that sort of thing, where you don't want to say to a student, well, of course you're struggling with math, right? We, um, and so those sorts of things will appear in advisor notes only. But you can see we try for um, the best that we can to map out as well when the classes will be offered. Um, but we are going to do these exploratory pathways within our career community. And so here's our lovely logo. I do like our, our pinwheel. And we're each assigned a color. So when we do our events and that sort of thing, we all have our appropriate colored t-shirts on. Um, and um, we're going to do these on-ramps exploratory pathways for each of these career communities. We weren't always able to get it down to one undecided pathway. We could for health sciences, but for liberal arts, I think we've got two. For STEM, I think we've got three. Um, business, three, and creative studies, one. So um, you can't always right, get it down to one in terms of these career communities. But the idea is if you're interested in business and you take the first um, term of an undecided pathway, then you can move into any of the degrees within that career community without losing time or money. Yeah. Does this include CTE as well? Are they inter intermixed with the academic side? Uh, the, oh, CTE. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, they are. Everything's mixed together. Um, in terms of the pathways, we probably have like an engineering transfer pathway and then more of an engineering applied pathway. And then I think for engineering, we had to do one more. I'm, I'm forgetting. I think it may have been the HVAC automotive students or something we had to do something slightly different with. But absolutely, so we have both transfer and um, those workforce pathways in place. But the idea, again, is it gives you one term at least to be able to think, you know, what do I, what do I want to do? And the idea is we're hopefully going to be able to put a hold on records. Yeah? So what do you do for, there are certain disciplines that sort of straddle that fence between social science and, and STEM. And, it, and, yeah. yeah, there was some thought about putting psychology in STEM. It is in some um, universities. Um, we took into account what the uh, departments wanted, but the big factor was curriculum because we knew from the get-go we wanted to have at least one term undecided pathways. And to make those happen, curriculum had to kind of trump all in terms of that. But we also think about workforce stuff. So what are the, the, um, the sector that this group of students connects to? So we did have six. We lost the orange one, which was IT. Um, 
we ended up cutting that one out the second year, and those different programs then got absorbed by the others. So for example, health information technology, or management I should say, was in, um, was in business. No, it was in IT. And then when it broke up, it got put into health. And that's where they wanted to be, because all of the employers that are gonna, those students want to access are through the healthcare system not through right an IT sort of system. And so the notion was that IT cuts across all of the career communities, and so that's the way that those ended up getting distributed. But it was an interesting six months to figure out how what went where. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. And again, there's a lot of challenges inherent to these undecided pathways that are different than just the program pathways. Um, but yeah, we're really excited about the potential for what this does for advising. We already know it's working so much better. We're all so much happier with this model. But it also puts us in regular face-to-face -face contact with our advisors too. Um, we have a steering committee for each of these, and it's made up of faculty and advisors largely, but also financial aid people. We all have a librarian on every committee as well for um, the career communities, because they're great accessors of information. And um, we do a lot of programming, some across the entire career communities. Um, we have a deciding day, for example, for undecided students, and some programming around that for them. Um, we have another program called um, Coffee, Cookies, and Careers. Um, and again, trying to get these undecided students to start thinking about being decided. And then we do things within the career community as well. So um, next week I have a liberal arts student showcase coming up next week. Because we felt left out, darn it. STEM has their drones and their robots that they show off. At, the creative studies people sing and dance, and we were feeling like we needed a way to showcase all the wonderful things that are happening in our classes to make sure that our faculty and administrators don't forget, right, the role that we play. So we're gonna have, um, we have about 100 people already accepted the appointment, and um, departments each have one or more student presentations or posters. Sign language students are interpreting it all for us. And so um, we're really excited right, about the ability to bring people together, advisors, faculty, students, and have this structure that really helps you do that. Without the structure, I think it's hard to figure out where do, do advisors and faculty naturally come together and meet. There isn't always that place, but this does create a structure. I'm going to show you Lorraine's, though, because they've done so much work, and I'm going to brag about them. Um, this is Lorraine County Community College. It's in Elyria, Ohio. And um, they did this um, and are going live with it um, in September, August. These are their undecided meta majors. So they have 12. And each of these, again, feeds into um, a number of pathways in general. And so if you clicked on, let's see, the healthcare one, wherever that is, the one with the stethoscope. Then it will take you into all of the degrees that fall into that particular meta major. And then if you clicked on nursing, it would pull up more of the specific nursing information, including the term-to-term -term curriculum guides, submission requirements, all of that good stuff. But what's really neat is they've done a lot to really figure out how individual courses map to a variety of degrees. So here you can see a student could take these seven courses and it will fit into any of these 12 business programs for those students. Um, if they continue and they wanted to take an additional accounting class, then they would eliminate two of those 12, but there's still 10 of the different program pathways that they could move into. And so I think it's so exciting to think about um, how we could do that as well. We're doing one term right now, but they've got some that are two terms, where a student can do two full terms before have to, having to move into a particular major, which I think is great because it is a lot of pressure on young people to decide what you want to do for the rest of your life. And I think any way that we can give them a little more flexibility is a great thing. So, How long has it taken them to get to that point? 
They've been working on this for, uh, they started at about the same time we did, and they are way far ahead of us. Their financial aid director is a very nice person. <laughs> Ours is nice too, he really is. Um, but yeah, it's this person that I think, it's her conversations that have taken place with our financial aid people that I think maybe we finally gotten over the hurdle and they're gonna let us do it. But it was actually Lorraine, their financial aid director, who's also like their vice provost or something, um, who I think helped me get it through. So, you know, I think there are ways that we can figure out kind of how to work together through some of this stuff as well. Um, but yeah, she did some of that heavy lifting um, around the financial aid stuff. This is the one I don't need to tell you guys about, is the DevEd stuff. And it's so important. I'm just, you don't, I'm going to like skip most of this because I think you guys know it. But um, time is the enemy. I understand you guys have really reduced your sequences. Are you starting to see um, some turnaround in terms of results? Yeah, it makes a huge difference. We did the same thing. We, um, this is actual numbers from Sinclair. This is actually how it worked out before we did any changes to DevEd. Of 100 students who started at the lowest level of DevEd, actually it was less than one. It was like 0.89. But I thought, I'll give myself that extra 0.01 or something. Um, so time is the enemy. And we know that. And any way we can accelerate students through is really important. Um, and so we do a lot of things here at Sinclair. But again, it sounds like you guys are are doing great things. I was at a conference, I can't remember where, but I was, I was like, oh, there's a Colorado presentation. And so I went, and do you guys know you have like a full page devoted to you in this? You guys are looking at me like, what is she holding up? No? Oh, maybe I'll have to leave it with you guys. But yeah, you have a whole page here talking about what faculty um, on your campuses are doing. I was hoping these people were in the room and I was gonna like have it autographed and signed for me. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of what conference it was. Yeah, here, anybody want to? I'll let you guys take a gander at it if you're interested. Um, you know, we've done a lot with the sequences, but placement has probably moved us just as much as reducing the sequences. And so I don't know what you guys might be doing around placement, but having to fine tune that has really helped us a great deal. With um, AccuPlacer, if a student scores in a particular range on the writing, um, it then prompts them to do a right placer. Have you guys heard of right placer before? Yeah. Yeah. And so we are now taking fours into college level English with uh, support, right? And so we've got tutoring and writing center and all of that sort of thing. But those fours are going right into English comp. And we've seen a dramatic reduction in the number of students in DevEd. We're also doing multiple measures pilots as well. Yeah. So um, we're being joined by 22 people um, via live stream. And um, a question from the audience is, with the landscape of de developmental education changing nationally, I was wondering if DevEd is part of MAPS at Sinclair. And if so, how are they incorporated? And how do they affect or inform MAPS? OK. Yeah, we do definitely have on-ramps. And they're much better now than they were when we started the work. I think you guys were really smart to tackle DevEd first. I'll, I wish we would have done it first before we had started the bigger pathway work. Because when we first started, we had all of those courses in the sequence. It was nearly impossible to get really good arms. There was just the matrix was too big. There were too many potential combinations. It was you know, ludicrous in terms of what advisors, we'd had to make like 75 different on-ramps. It was silly. But now that we've really reduced the, the sequence, things are working much better for us. So we can do on-ramps, right, into the programs based on where students test in. We also combined our reading and writing. So we used to place students in three developmental um, areas, reading, writing, and math. And we have recently combined reading and writing together, um, and we no longer have DevEd reading classes. And that seems to be helping us as well, because just doing those things together certainly reduces the sequences. We also do a lot of half-term courses for DevEd, so AB, um, eight-week term courses. And that's a nice format, students tell us, because 
If there is some issue and they don't make it through, they can just repeat it again the same term and they're not off map. We can work that out for them. And then we are also using technology. What are you guys using in terms of your advising or to create your pathways? Do you have um, a system that you're integrating your, your pathways into? What's that? Okay. Yeah, this is the way ours works. So, and MAP is open source, if you're interested. Um, but I always say it's open source. It's free like a puppy, like a new puppy. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you want it, you can have it, but hope you got some good IT people, because you got to do a lot of right, customizing it to you. But it is part of our larger SSP student success um, software. And um, again, students, um, we give ideal maps. That's what the faculty create are these ideal maps. But we absolutely know that our students' lives are not ideal. And so these um, maps are made to be able to move them around. Um, advisors literally drop and drag classes right, in, in our system. And so if they need to modify for a dev ed on ramp and move it back a term, if they, um, you know, for any reason, that they can't do the ideal, right? Maybe they can only take 12 a term instead of the 15 that we've got in our pathways. They can easily move that around in the system. It also communicates back to the student. So they see their map. They see it at the point of registration as well. Um, and it says here are the things that you have said you want to take. Um, they don't have to take what it says, though. So the maps don't register the students for courses. Um, and uh, that's an important distinction because we have to make sure our students know that. When we first started doing this, our students were like, I did sign up for classes. You gave me a map. And we were like, oh, we should tell you, right, that you have to still register. <laughs> Just because we put these on this piece of paper for you, you still need to register for them. And so um, we're dealing with those issues. But I can see every map of every student in every one of my classes. When I pull up the roster for my class, there's an icon for the map. I can click right on it. It opens up, and I can see whether the student's on or off map, see who their advisor is, see if notes have been written. Um, and within um, of the system, I can communicate back as well to the advisors. And so it really does give us this ability to improve our feedback. I don't think you should ever let technology be the, the tail wagging the dog, though. Don't make it work for you. No, I said that backwards. Make it work for you, don't work for it. Um, because sometimes you can do so much work, right, that it's the technology that's wagging everything instead of the dog. So this is another advisor view. And so here you can see the courses, again, that they can drop and drag um, into it. This is a high level view of the student view. And so you can see some of their notes that are placed in there, as well as there's an elective, so you can see that the um, links have been included there as well. We're also using Civitas, and we've just got into predictive analytics. It's a little bit early to know how this is going to work, but we have milestones in our pathways, both academic and non-academic, and they are tracking the academic ones for us. They match up with our um, performance funding model, um, matrices so that the high, the real important people in our institutions can look and see how we're measuring up to those matrices. So it's course completion, um, credit accumulation, GPA, um, that sort of stuff. And then we have a, a lot of non-academic milestones to join the psych club, that sort of thing. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I think can happen in a department that wasn't doing much before. I feel like that new Verizon commercial, have you seen it, where it's like, you're four times better than you were before. And how bad were you? You know, if you got four times better and you're still not the best, right, then what does that mean? But um, before we began our pathway work and other things in the psych department, for a period of five years, I looked at the, uh, the number of students we were graduating, and we averaged about 17 graduates a year. And they were graduating, and oh god, it makes me sick to my stomach, with 91.92 credit hours on average. When I look back at this, it literally makes me want to cry. That we didn't do anything, that I wasn't back there then going, holy cow, what's going on? But it wasn't my, it's not where my attention was focused. No one's were, you know. And so now I look back at it and it just makes me so angry at myself 
that we didn't do something earlier. In the last uh, three years, we've averaged 44.4 graduates. Um, this last year, it was 58. So that's really when we were in scale for two years, and we saw a big jump. The first two were in their 30s, um, and then this last one, um, was up to almost 60, and that we're ho hoping to improve from there. But it's an increase of over 150% in graduation rates. And the new mean number for credit hours, we've got 64 in our program. we still got too many, but 74 average now. It's a full semester less, right? We also um, have a mandatory, again, soft mandatory orientation. We do a transfer program that students are required to come to as well once a year. Um, we also do programs with other um, departments. So we worked on tools for advisors and for students around complicated career choices and decisions like social work, counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist. Um, for all of our general psychology sections, our big one, we do only open ed resources. Our students have no textbook fees for general psychology, and we're doing our best to move in that direction for our other classes as well. Um, and we won't pick a book that costs more than $100. We made a commitment as a department that we would not ask students to ever spend more than $100 moving forward um, because we were in the past. Right? Back when we weren't graduating anybody, we were making them buy all sorts of books, too. Two and three sometimes for a class. Give me a break. We can do better than that. Right? We can definitely improve. We have a really active uh, student group, too. Any psychologists in the room see the famous psychologist in the picture? It is a Zimbardo. Yay! Yeah, our students took a trip um, to hear him speak. And our faculty member got involved in a project with him called the Heroic Imagination Project. She goes next month to a, a training conference with Phil Zimbardo. And if you're not in psych, it's like going to a conference with Freud. I mean, it's a huge deal. Um, and our students are going to participate in this research project, which is around peer mentoring um, and um, reducing stereotype threat. So we're really excited about that. You know, if, if, you, if I just say one thing today, and I know we're out of time, I really hope the advisors and the faculty will come together. Um, it's the thing I'm most proud of at Sinclair, and that nobody bitches at me about. Um, that universally, we are all happy that we are now talking to each other, we're working with each other towards meeting our students' goals, and we're no longer playing the blame game. This is a comment from one of our advisors, and so I asked her if I could include it. And I think it kind of sums up the general feeling. Because um, advisors didn't like being in that generalized model either. Nobody wants to advise programs that they don't really understand. And so we really have turned around advising. And we get great um, satisfaction. Uh, ratings from our students now. The last one, 97% satisfaction rating. And I won't tell you what it was before. It was not 97%. Again, you know, you have, certainly the curriculum is, is something to, I'm going to skip over here because I know we're out of time. Um, but I did want to really encourage you. Our um, president calls this the big room. Um, this is where we graduate students at the University of Dayton Arena. And I like this one because the vantage point is from the faculty point. We sit behind the stage there, right, right behind the stage. And so this is what I see when I look down. And I used to not give a crap, I'll be honest with you. For years I went to graduation, I didn't even pay attention. And now it matters to me. Now I can see my students walk across the stage. And it really matters. And so look how happy your people are when they graduate. They jump up and down. So I, I really want to commend you for all of the great work you're already doing. And I just know you guys are going to do wonderful things um, with your pathway work, too. And we're out of time. I'll do like I do in my classes. We've technically ran out of time. But if you would like to stay here with me, and I'll answer your question. Um, so I don't know if we have time for, if anybody has a burning question or anything. Yeah. Um, you know, there's lots of talks about these metameters. Did you do the pathways and then metameters came from that? Yes. Did you have your metameters? We, um, before, um, we, no, the, the exploratory pathways came after. 
So this change in the advising model occurred during the pathway process, and so we were already doing the program um, pathways, and then that's when the, the new project started. So it was through the process. Um, so no, it didn't occur before. Yeah. In fact, I think the pathway work really helped to form the relationships between faculty and advisors that made the move to these career communities much easier and made more sense. We started to really identify who were the experts, who needed to go in liberal arts, and who needed to go in STEM. And um, they also started cross-training at that point as well. So when an advisor would come into the department to review, it would be an advisor that really understood your program well, and then often two or three other advisors, often newer, that maybe didn't know your program as well. And so it was a way for us to train advisors as we moved to this new system as well and start to see right, who was going to be in what community. Other parting thoughts? Well, bad teacher, because I did keep you four minutes over. You're never going to make it across campus to your next class in time. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you guys. OK. Yeah. Please do. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. So happy now. So all of this work, and then you can you all also help me thank Jim and Laura for the amazing presentation. I don't know if they knew what they were. Yes, they have. I don't know if they knew what they were getting into, but they've done a marvelous job of, of leading this initiative, and we're very thankful uh, to the work that you've done. What we're going to do is take a break, and then we're going to come back at 12:30. And at that time, Mary will still be here. So if you have those burning questions and maybe something you don't want to bring up in the larger group, please please make time to do that. Um, I understand there's a map about the map, so I'm going to pass that off right now. Right. OK, so let me just take a minute to talk about logistics for the afternoon. I'm so happy to see so many of you here. So we don't have this room for the afternoon. We have 10 classrooms. So I created a map for maps. And it's up here. We can hand these out. Um, just, just so you know, and, and many of you know, there's a spreadsheet on the other side, so it's okay. Um, so this map will show on, on the map itself, it'll show the individual classrooms with the three-letter prefixes, so you can find your three-letter prefix on the map and find your classroom that way, or there's a list along with the larger campus map on the other side. Actually, there's two slightly different versions of this, but you've got a list on one side, a map on the other side, and at 12.30, the IT consultants will be in each of those rooms corresponding to those three letter prefixes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? That was less than a minute, and I have two. All right. Who do I hand this off to? I have a quick question. So, yeah. at my group, for example, we're all coming sort of a little bit late, so I'm guessing that it's, it's kind of a drop. The sessions will go from 12 30 to 4, so coming a little bit late isn't going to hurt it. And oh, there are snacks, though, starting, I think, at 12 30 in 1526, which is also labeled and it says food on here. Uh, there are laptops. You, if you brought your own, that's great. Uh, a couple of the rooms are computer rooms and they're labeled. I can't believe I forgot this. And you can check out a laptop, though, also in room uh, 1526. So if you have any questions, 1526 is the place to go after 1230. Right? Anything else I need to add? And big thanks to Isaiah for helping to organize all of those rooms. So thank you.